It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. Therefore, is in keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the option to get in fellowship if necessary. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. We've noted how Satan has a strategy to control nations. Now we're going to note that religion is a part of Satan's strategy. In fact, it is his ace, Trump. Religion is part of Satan's strategy. Religion Religion, not Christianity. I'm not talking about Christianity. Religion is the creation of Satan's genius to counterfeit the plan of God. Religion is what? Religion is man seeking to use his own merits, his own works, his own ability to gain the approval of God. Satan's counterfeits of the plan of God and religion include many different counterfeits. First of all, there's a counterfeit gospel. We know the gospel. The gospel's the good news. The good news is the fact we don't have to do anything except believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Acts 16.31a. John 3.16 God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son so that whosoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. That's the way of salvation. But Satan has a counterfeit gospel that says faith plus. Or no faith at all, just works. Faith plus something, or just works. And the further you go into works, the further in debt you go. So that's the counterfeit gospel. Second Corinthians 4, 3 through 4 describes this counterfeit gospel. And that means that people are saying that there is something else that can save you other than Jesus Christ. Although we know that no name under heaven given among men by which man can be saved except by Jesus Christ. We note that as part of the gospel. The good news. Jesus Christ has saved us. There are counterfeit ministers. There are those ministers, very few today, who teach the word of God. And there are those ministers who are counterfeit. What makes many of these ministers counterfeit has to do with their own mental attitude and the fact that they've fallen under the cosmic system. Even though many of them may be believers, they've fallen under the cosmic system and they've fallen under something called this, which we studied yesterday. Attention-seeking behavior. There are... Many people who claim to be pastors, and they're only pastors for one reason, attention-seeking behavior. It may not come out too clear on camera, but at least you know what I'm saying. Here I am pointing attention-seeking behavior. And this is why many pastors have gone astray. Because their attention... It's not toward God. Their attention has shifted toward people. And they have said to themselves, Rapport with people is more important than rapport with God. So they go along with their congregation. And their congregation, oftentimes, is way off and wrong and needs a good butt kicking. But they won't give their congregation a butt, keep, a butt kicking. Why? Because they have attention-seeking behavior. And they have the wrong attitude. And always with this wrong attitude they say, Couldn't you say that a bit nicer? Couldn't you say that in a different tone? Couldn't you say that in a more proper language? 
They say that to pastors. Do they say that to what they watch on television? No. Do they say that to what they hear on the radio? No. Do they say that to politicians who lie all the time? No. They only say it to pastors. Why? Because they have the idea that rapport with people, people this way, is more important than rapport with God. If any pastor has attention-seeking behavior, it should be simply toward God. Say, God, I'm doing the right thing, right? And you'll know it because of Bible doctrine. And you'll say, I'm doing the right thing. This is toward God. And that's not uh, necessarily attention-seeking behavior. That's just something that's going to happen. But most pastors go in for toward people. I've got to see a large crowd is what they say. One fella told me I'll never have a church. Big whoop. Like I care. If I don't have a church, i got to do something else. But either way, I have uh, people ordering from different places around the country and more people are listening on the internet and from other places around the country and the world that make up for anything else. I'll never have a church. Why? Because this, this is what they think. I need to be seeking the attention of people. I cannot offend people. When you teach the Word of God, it's going to offend people. Period. And if you try to wiggle your way around the Word of God, then you've gone in for this. Attention-seeking behavior. And you're acting just like Satan. Satan has attention-seeking behavior. And he had it so bad, it has turned into this an attention-seeking disorder. As I told you the other day, we all start out with attention-seeking behavior in childhood. Why? We all have an old sin nature. But once we believe in Christ, this thing needs to be put away. It's called approbation lust. Approbation lust is one of the most subtle yet insidious sins that takes people away from doctrine. It causes people to compromise. It causes people to compromise with legalism. Attention-seeking behavior caused James, the half-brother of Christ, to be to die along with all of his church. You see, he had 10,000 members. And so, with those 10,000 members, he decided to compromise Okay, I will teach legalism. And the members of the congregation led him astray. Why? He liked their attention. What about God? No thinking about God, just what people think. And that some people may go into this attention-seeking behavior. They may even develop a church in which they have a lot of people. Why? They're all seeking one thing attention the pastor gives attention to the congregation pats him on the back it's going to be okay brother everything's going to be all right when it's not and then the congregation pats the pastor on the back that was a good message even though it sucked attention seeking behavior that's what satan had which eventually turned into a disorder people today have attention seeking disorders it's called hypochondria, for one. People act sick in order to receive attention. People make their children sick, poisoning them, etc., in order to receive attention. Attention-seeking disorder, for sure. People do all sorts of things for attention. Attention from whom? Others. What happened to your rapport with God? It's gone. You're in the cosmic system. And why did Satan decide to himself, I will be like the Most High God? He broke that rapport with God and he said, I want the attention of the angels. He broke his rapport with God and said, I want rapport with angels. Besides, it's just one God. You see, God had given him everything. Extreme power. 
the greatest power ever. Extreme beauty, the greatest beauty ever. A beautiful voice like a pipe organ, the greatest voice ever. God had given him all of those things. And yet, he took those things that God gave him and said, you know what? Attention from God's not enough. And God paid Satan a lot of attention in order to make him the highest ranking of all angels. And you know what he said to himself? Attention from God, not enough. God is just one person besides. I think I can be better than God. Rebellion. And then he said, I will make myself like the Most High God. And he did that for one reason. He wanted the attention of angels. And he got the attention of billions of angels. In fact, he got the attention of one-third of angels. And you know what one-third of the angels said? He was so beautiful. He had the voice of a pipe organ. He was so persuasive that a third of the angels said, you know what? This Satan fellow might be able to pull it off. In fact, I think he is greater than God. Well, he must be greater than God. Look at him. He's beautiful. But you see, when it comes to God, he was invisible. Invisible to the angels even. But Satan was visible So what did the angels do? They took what was visible. A third of them did. The angels took what was visible and said, How beautiful Satan is. What a beautiful voice Satan has. What a beautiful personality Satan has. Oh, how Satan has treated me so well. How Satan has patted me on the back. How Satan has told me how wonderful I am. I feel like I'm part of his family. He is so sweet to me. Well, Satan is such a sweet creature. I'll follow Satan. And a third of the angels who have an intellect higher than ours, a third of the angels followed Satan. Why? They had the same lust. Attention. Well, who did they want attention from? Satan. They loved Satan. They wanted attention from Satan. Who did Satan want attention from? The angels. So they scratched each other's back. That describes 100% of all Baptist churches in South Carolina and around this country. You scratch your back, or you scratch my back, and I'll scratch yours. I'll tell you everything's going to be okay, brother. And you tell me how great my sermon is, and we will have a wonderful relationship attention, approbation. And most people believe that churches are all about approbation. Attention seeking is approbation. Approval. This could be approval, attention seeking, approbation, whatever. It's all synonyms. But uh, all most churches today are formed around one thing. The satanic attitude of approval. Approval from whom? People. 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 I hope you get this. It's from people, not God. Rapport with God is what is important. That's it. Who cares what the world thinks? The world is against us. We've noted that. Satan is against us. He's the enemy of the church. Yet people go with personality. And people have the idea, well, if that pastor, oh, he's a good pastor, but. He's a good pastor, but. He says this word and that word and this word and that word, and that might offend somebody. So what? If people are so easily offended, they'll be offended anyway. (laughs) And if I were to give a message that were clean, you wouldn't listen. That is clean in terms of proper and what people think. People would not listen. If I were to get up here and speak in a holy language and say, turn in your Bibles to Revelation 12, 9, we are going to study the Satan strategy. 
And we are going to see how Satan has deceived the world. And I will tell you how Satan has deceived the world. You know what? People would go to sleep, as they almost are just for me doing that. People would go to sleep. So what do you got to do? Throw out a word here and there. What do you got to do? Raise your voice every now and then. Voice inflection. You've got to shock people into what? Listening. Because I guarantee you, most people aren't listening today. You've got to raise your voice. You've got to use voice inflection. You have got to use words of shock to shock them into what? Listening! We're not going to follow in this church any of the protocol of Satan. That's the protocol of Satan. The protocol of Satan is you must say this. You must say that. You cannot say this word. You cannot say that word. Why not? Because it reveals truth. Shocking people into the truth. You can't do that because maybe there's one person who will be shocked into the truth. Oh yes, a great majority will criticize. But there's always that one person who says, you know what? That's the truth and I don't care. It's the truth and I don't care. Now it takes a while to build up a church and this is what we have to understand. The Apostle Paul spent 13 years without a congregation. The Apostle Paul spent 13 years with a small congregation. And the Apostle Paul, when he is, was about to die, had one person by his side named Luke. The Apostle Paul! Why? He wasn't scared. He wasn't into a, a attention-seeking behavior among people. He just wanted to do what God said was right. And you know that was his... That was even his motivation... Believe it or not, as an unbeliever. As an un now he was positive. Now he had not come to believe in Christ, but he was positive. And as an unbeliever, he sought to what? Seek the approval of people? No. He always sought the approval of God, and God saw that positive volition. That's why he, on the road to, to Damascus, saw that flash of light. And none of the other religious people did. Why? He was positive. He didn't stone people because he thought people would praise him. He stoned people because he thought it was right. He could have cared less what people thought. That's the way Paul was, <laughs> Paul was that way from the beginning, even as an unbeliever. He cared less what people thought as an unbeliever. He was a tough man. And he would have killed Christians no matter what people thought. And people could have came up to him and said, aren't you being a little harsh on these Christians? And he would have said, no, I'm following God's will. Stand behind me and watch me follow God's will. Tough man. He didn't care what people thought. He thought he was doing God's bidding by killing Christians. That's why he, and only he among all those religious people, received that light on the road to Damascus. That's why he received the gospel and accepted it. He finally saw something tougher than him. He was blinded. Lord Jesus Christ said, Why are you persecuting me? And he said, I'm not persecuting you, Lord. And he says, You've been persecuting my church. It shocked Paul. The only way somebody like Paul would believe is to be shocked into it. So don't ever question my wording. Some people need to be shocked into stuff. The Apostle Paul needed to be shocked. And he needed to be shocked so heavily, Jesus Christ himself dealt with the shock. He blinded him three days straight. I don't have that power. But I do have the verbiage and the words to use to shock some people. And if you're shocked, so what? If it's right and if it's from Scripture, believe it. But Apostle Paul was shocked. But the thing about the Apostle Paul is he never really was interested in what people thought. Even as a religious man. You know what? As a religious man, he just wanted to follow the law. He wanted to go to heaven. His whole thing was, well, if I can go to heaven by following the law, then I'll go to heaven by following the law. 
And therefore, I will follow the law and become very self-righteous and I will kill Christians myself. I don't care. But if that's how I'm going to get to heaven, that's how I'm going to do it. And then went on the road to Damascus. He changed his mind about Christ. And when he changed his mind about Christ, what did he do? He had a change of mind and therefore his attention went toward God. And the Apostle Paul spent many years out in the desert studying the Word of God. And yet, he had no contact with people during that time either. He was in the middle of a desert learning the Word of God with no contact with people. You have to understand, understand something else about Paul. He never got married. He had the gift of celibacy. Most people would go nuts if they've never been married. Paul didn't. Paul never even experienced marriage but knew what it was all about. Paul gave some of the greatest verses ever on marriage. Never was married, but knew more about it than anyone on the face of the earth. Why? He had the doctrine. He knew marriage wouldn't make him happy. In fact, he knew he was happier for not getting married. And that's why he said, I wish everyone to be as I am. That's because he was happy outside of marriage, and he knew that with marriage comes trouble, usually. Not always, but usually. So his attention always was toward God. Even as an unbeliever, he thought, I must please God. He did it in the wrong way. Then as a believer, he said, I must have approval from God. So as a believer, he still functioned toward God. Rarely did the Apostle Paul ever function in his attention-seeking, he rarely had attention-seeking behavior until... He ran into James. And that was the biggest mistake he ever made. And that was the first time ever the Apostle Paul had a, a switch of thought. Usually for the Apostle Paul it was, I need to impress God. And how do you impress God? Well, you don't do it. Christ already did it for you. And he understood that. He believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, he received plus R. And he said, therefore, I'm approved by God. I have the attention of God. And then he learned doctrine. And he came up to a point of dikaiosune, which is also plus R. That is the righteousness you learn from the spiritual life. He developed that. And that was toward God. And he had that. And he was always seeking the attention of God. And he did it through grace. The only way you can get a, the attention of God is through grace. Now... He made a mistake. He went toward James. He went to Jerusalem when God told him not to. And when he went there, he compromised. And what happened? He went from the attention-seeking of God. He went from, this is the better way to prove it, attention-seeking, not really. A, uh, well let's say R, rapport. He went from rapport with God and he had a change of mind and said now I want rapport with my people the Jews and when he made that switch and said no longer do I want rapport with God I want rapport with my people the Jews that was the biggest mistake he ever made in his life and he almost died in the sin face to face with death chew on that the Apostle Paul, the greatest apostle ever, almost died the sin face to face with death because he switched his attention from God to people. And he said to himself, I want rapport with people. And he compromised. He took a vow. And vows are not part of the spiritual life today. Our spiritual life is far above and beyond vows. We have our portfolio of invisible assets. We have the omnipotence of Jesus Christ controlling history. And we have the omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit who gives us our unique spiritual life. So even Paul went into this attention-seeking behavior. It did not become a disorder for Paul, however. For Satan, it's a disorder now. He has a real disorder, a mental disorder. He wants the attention of people. 
He wants the attention of angels. In fact, how else could you describe it? Since he wants to be like the Most High God, you're going to have to... What's the reason why he wanted to be the Most High God? Attention. He wanted to receive the attention of angels. When he was an elect angel, before he fell, he looked at all these angels and he saw them praising God. He looked at all the angels around him, including himself. He praised God himself as an elect angel. And he looked at all these elect angels praising God. And what creeped into his mind was a sin. He had volition. And he had a volition to think this. And he did as many humans. Well, I want to be like that. I want that attention. Why can't I have that attention? And he looked at himself as a excuse me, as it were, in the mirror. And he said, I'm beautiful. My voice is so beautiful. God is invisible. The angels, they really don't know much about him. But look at me. I'm so beautiful. I have a beautiful voice. I have a uh, beautiful facade. Everything about me is so great. Well, I could be like the Most High God. I could do that. And if I did that, I would have the attention of all the angels. So he did it. And he fell into a an attention an attention seeking disorder. Satan fell into an attention seeking disorder. And he's there today. And because he wants so much attention, he has set up an elaborate system. And the whole world is following Satan and he loves it. Oh, whether the people know it or not, they don't know it, but Satan knows it. And he just gets to, you know what? He gets to point at God and say, Look at all the people following me. <laughs> don't think he don't think that way. He might not go to God with that much gumption and say that. It's possible in his arrogance. But he sees all this, all the world following him. And he's not going to give up. Why not? Why give up? Some people have asked me before, why doesn't Satan just give up? He has to know he's lost. Look at the world today. Look at how all the world has fallen under satanic propaganda. Look at how the whole world hates Israel, including a little less than half of Americans. Why wouldn't Satan think... I might be able to win this. Why wouldn't he think that? When he has been able through his web of deceit to deceive all the nations of the world. Of course he thinks that. And why wouldn't he think that when through religion he's been able to deceive even Americans where there was a great pivot. He's been able to deceive believers into thinking and has been able to believe has been able to deceive pastors who teach believers that somehow you can invite Christ into your heart and be saved a religion you're spiritually dead you can't invite Christ anywhere when you're spiritually dead if you're dead you can invite no one to a party or anything else you're dead you don't invite Christ invites come unto me all ye who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest Jesus Christ invites, but Satan flips it around. And Satan flips it all around, a whole different system called religion. And he takes the phrase of that Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye who labor and heavy laden, and he just turns it around and says, Invite Jesus Christ. It's a whole flip, a whole turnaround of that whole phrase. Jesus invites you, and then Satan says, Nah, 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 uh-uh. You invite Jesus. And then you invite Jesus under Satan's system and what have you done? Nothing. You're still unsaved. And there are many people who have invited Christ into their heart and are hell bound. And that's important. It's very important. And that's why on the radio messages I've been making, I've been making it very clear. It's faith alone and Christ alone. And I don't care who's offended. Because we're dealing with people's souls. And Satan wants people to be offended when somebody comes up and says, Uh uh, 
You're not saved by inviting Christ into your heart. I've seen it before. I've seen people become furious when they've heard my pastor say, you can't invite Christ into your heart and be saved. And I've seen them go into a fury. Personally. Seen them go into a fury. Why? They've been indoctrinated into Satan's system. And Satan has a stronger hold today in this country than God. And why? Volition. And people in this country have a choice. And so he is... And religion as part of Satan's strategy is he comes up with a different gospel, number one. Number two, he comes up with false ministers. And these false ministers have attention-seeking behavior and oftentimes fall into an attention-seeking disorder. And they are the jealous type. They have a jealous streak that runs right down their back. And they need the attention of someone. And they need someone to pat them on the back and say, you've done a good job. And they are dumb. Oh, they're not dumb intellectually. They are dumb spiritually. Dumb. Because they seek human approval over God's approval. How do I know? How do I know these things? Because so many people say, can't come to Bible class because of... Uh, we got to do this. We got to do that. We got to do the other. I can't come to Bible class. No way. Oh, so and so can't come to Bible class anymore. Uh, my children can't come to Bible class anymore. And besides, they've got to cheerlead and shake their butt in front of a bunch of horny teenagers. Well, that's way more important than Bible doctrine now, isn't it? Oh, that's way more important. You've got to you've got to only teach this much because if you don't stop, if you if you don't teach this much, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, uh, this, uh, well, we just well, we just can't have nobody come here anymore. We just can't have so and so show up. They cheerleading, cheerleading, cheerleading. Yes, cheerleading. Unbelievable, unfathomable to me. Now, that's how it's pronounced. Unfathomable. Unfathomable. Absolutely. Stupid. It's so stupid. I wouldn't let my daughter cheerlead for nothing. I know those chair. I went to school in the uh, 90s. And uh, I know we have a cheerleader amongst us, but too bad. I went to school in the 90s, and I saw what those cheerleaders did. In the South, the religious South. <laughs> cheerleading? I might as well been at a strip joint. Cheerleading? Oh, it's different today than what it used to be. That was no cheerleading, people. That was not cheerleading. There was... Uh, there's nothing wrong with it, I'll tell you that, but uh, the only thing it's going to do is make the eyes of the young men pop out. That's all it's for. And that to be more important than doctrine, it just makes you it makes you want to laugh. If it weren't so sad, it'd make you want to laugh. But it's sad. It's really sad. And when you inculcate into your children, cheerleading is more important than doctrine, what do you think they're going to turn out as? Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. But that's Satan's strategy in terms of religion, false ministers. And in that false minister area, attention-seeking behavior. Cheerleaders, by the way. All the cheerleaders I have ever known, except one. All the cheerleaders I've ever known have this. I say that. I won't tell you. This. Uh, <laughs> by far. Every cheerleader I ever knew in high school had this attention seeking behavior. And they were beautiful, no doubt. I went to school with them. I used to sit beside some very beautiful cheerleaders. And I would look at them as a young man, red blooded American, and say, That is one good looking girl right there. That's all I would think to myself, though. But they went into a huge attention-seeking behavior. And before you knew it, most of those cheerleaders, drug abuse. This is what happened. 
Why? They made a big thing out of this attention factor. And so they went to parties, drug abuse, alcohol abuse as teenagers. Drug abuse, alcohol abuse, all sorts of things. Pregnancy, that's one of them. Had some cheerleaders become pregnant. All sorts of sins of degeneracy. Big party animals now. Why? Well, now that they're cheerleaders, they get all types of attention, especially from the young men. And the young men say, come to my party. And the young girl says, okay, let me tell my parents. I'm going over to Susie's house tonight, and we're going to have a get-together and play with dolls. Parents say, okay. So the young teenage girl goes over to the house of the young men who have said, come to my party. There's no Barbie doll there. There's drugs. There's alcohol. There's sex. <laughs> and the parents, how can parents be so blind they grew up in the same school system? They want to be. They want to be, I guess. And I guess they really don't care. The only conclusion I can go to is, well, they don't understand the pull of attention. What they say is, that would never happen with my children. You are so full of shit. <laughs> you tell me, your children have an old sin nature. And they will go into that stuff just as you did as children. Maybe that's why some people in church had such bloodshot eyes. So, Satan has a strategy to uh, be in the uh, religion. Number three, doctrine. Number one, the gospel. Number two, ministers. Number three, false doctrine. Number four, a false communion table. A false communion table. That occurred in the Corinthian church. In the Corinthian church, they went in for violence. They went in for drunkenness and violence. Number five, a false spirituality. Number five, a false spirituality. You can be spiritual by being healthy. False spirituality. You can be spiritual by stopping this and stopping that false spirituality ask yourself this and if you don't know the answer you're an idiot after listening to me for this long not an idiot but you just haven't been listening ask yourself this what is spirituality if you can't answer that question you are in deep doo doo what is spirituality what is spirituality very simple question very simple answer Filling of God the Holy Spirit. That is spirituality. Period. Doesn't have anything to do with health. You can be in terrible health and be filled with the Spirit. Doesn't have anything to do with exercise. Exercise is of some value, but the spiritual life is way above that. Has nothing to do with exercise. Yes, that's ugly, but it's not as ugly as people that think that way. I make it ugly because people are ugly when they think this way. Has nothing to do with health, exercise, smoking. You can be filled with the spirit and have a lit cigarette hanging out of your mouth. Believe it or not, you can. Some people don't believe that. It's true. It has nothing to do with any of this. Stop doing this, stop doing that. Stop doing the other thing. Start doing this and start doing that. The simple phrase is this. If an unbeliever can do it, it is not the spiritual way of life. An unbeliever cannot be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And that is your spiritual life, period, over and out. And you know what happens when people begin to understand that spirituality is simply the filling of God the Holy Spirit? Gossip, maligning, and judging go out the window. Why? Because you don't know if a believer is spiritual or not. Unless you talk to him long enough. No way you can know. 
You can't look at some believer walking down the street and say, Look, there's a believer filled with the Spirit. There's a He's so pious looking, looking heavenward, he must be filled with the Spirit. Well, look at that man on the street, that white-haired man with the long beard who has a cane. He's walking down the street like this. He must be spiritual. No, you cannot see what is invisible. And the Holy Spirit is invisible, invisible, and you cannot tell if a believer is filled with the Spirit or not. People don't understand spirituality today. Christians, believers, don't understand spirituality. And that's because Satan has come up with, number one, a counterfeit gospel. Number two, counterfeit ministers. Number three, a counterfeit doctrine. Number four, a counterfeit communion table. Number five, a counterfeit spirituality. Number six, a counterfeit righteousness. A counterfeit righteousness as part of Satan's composite a counterfeit righteousness. The Mosaic Law is distorted into a counterfeit righteousness. Satan has distorted the Mosaic Law into a counterfeit righteousness. And there are believers who think they fulfilled the spiritual life because they've lived moral lives and they're wrong. Just because you've lived a moral life doesn't mean you've lived a spiritual life. And there are going to be a lot of moral believers in heaven in shame in a resurrection body because they laughed at the spiritual life. They scorned the spiritual life. They took the side of Satan. They became enemies of the cross and did not know it. But they will know it. And they made their own choice from their own volition, from their own arrogance. Each one of us has equal privilege and equal opportunity. And when someone chooses for self-righteousness, they've had equal privilege and equal opportunity to go the right route. It's a matter of volition. It has always been a matter of volition since Satan made his choice to be like the Most High God. And it's a matter of volition today. And when you see religious people in your own family who are believers but have gone in for the satanic strategy and have decided to be servants of Satan, they decided it on their own volition. And many of them have had chance after chance after chance after chance to get out of it but have said no, 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 and have been a pain in the rump to every believer who has executed the spiritual life. Why? Volition. And they made their choice, and they're not going to have an excuse, and they're going to know it. They may even try to come up with an excuse, but there's not going to be there. They're just not going to have an excuse. Well, that wasn't the way I was raised. Well, remember that time you went to that church where they taught some doctrine? Uh oh. You could have went along with that. Uh oh. No excuse. God is fair. God gives everyone a fair shake. And every believer who has fallen into religion has had a fair shake. And every unbeliever who never believes in Jesus Christ has had a fair shake. Why? God is fair. And just. And righteous. It's a, it has to do with volition and we live in a time where volition has decided to go against doctrine we live in a time of apostasy people have made their decision and some people are destined to hell because of their decision so the Mosaic law is distorted into self-righteousness and self-righteousness, in effect, rejects faith in Christ for relationship with God, and it absolutely does. You can go up to a legalist who has, in the beginning, believed in Christ, and you can tell them, I believed in Christ, but they will say, but do you show it through your morality? And they'll quote from the book of James, which they know nothing about. And they will say, well, the devil believes in gods and shudder. Well, he should shudder. Of course the devil believes in God. He was created by God. 
You know what that means when it says in James the devil believes in God and shudders? You know what it means? It means the Jews who believe in God should shudder. It means every religious person who believes in God should shudder. It means the Muslim should shudder. What James is talking about are religious people who have believed in God. And he's saying, yes, you've believed in God, so has Satan. But you have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're working your way into heaven. Yes, you believed in God, but you don't believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for you. That's what James is saying. Yet they twist it around. Well, even uh, Satan believes in God and shudders. Well, you believe in God too, and you need to shudder. The issue is, have you believed in Christ? And when James is talking about God, he's talking about God the Father. But they wouldn't know that because they don't know Greek and they don't know straight up from straight down. They never will. Why? Volition. They don't want to. They don't want to know. So we have counterfeit spirituality, counterfeit righteousness. We have a counterfeit dynamic number seven counterfeit power and counterfeit dynamics number seven counterfeit power and counterfeit dynamics you know what that deals with miracles healings and tongues dynamics people think that uh, when someone performs a miracle ooh that's dynamic when someone speaks in tongues or allegedly speaks in tongues oh that's dynamic when someone goes into for healing Oh, that's so dynamic. They were once unable to walk. Now they can walk. They've distorted dispensations and everything else. It's a distortion, a satanic distortion. And therefore, they have distorted power and dynamics. And the fastest growing group of believers in the world is the Pentecostal movement. And the Pentecostal movement oftentimes doesn't even give the gospel and many people in the in the Pentecostal movement are not even saved I would venture out to say even a majority of the people in the Pentecostal movement are not saved because they do not receive the gospel message they receive a dynamic from Satan of false miracles wonders and healings false healings oh Satan may be involved in it in a very few cases most of it's a hoax for money but in some cases, Satan is actually involved in which he will take a demon-possessed person who has a health problem, an unexplained health problem that the doctors have not been able to cure, and they don't know anything about it, and they say, well, we don't understand. We can't cure your uh, wonderful grandmother. So they take their wonderful grandmother, their sweet grandmother, to the Benny Hinn place, and they pull this wonderful grandmother possessed with a demon, because she was always an unbeliever and maybe not even anyone knew about it. And she takes this demon-possessed grandmother up to Benny Hinn and uh, Benny Hinn has contact with the demon. Bop on the head. Demon pops out. Grandma jumps up from a wheelchair. And everybody says, Amen, Hallelujah. A false dynamic! We have dynamics that are far greater than any miracles and healings. We have a dynamic that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a dynamic that allowed Jesus Christ to die on the cross without hopping off of it. We have the same unique spiritual life Jesus Christ was given. He was given the prototype. He tested and proved it. He gave it to us in the form of a protocol. And we have that. And that is far greater than any miracle. It is far greater than when Moses held up his hand and the Red Sea split. Yet many people look at that and say, Wow, I wish I was there. No! Wish you were here right now with the spiritual life that we have because Moses didn't have it. David didn't have it. Yes, there were miracles. And miracles do occur even today from the sovereignty of God. But we have something greater called a unique spiritual life that Moses never had. Yet people will be led astray so quickly by power and by the power and dynamics of miracles, healings, and tongues found in Second Thessalonians two eight through ten. Write it down. 
2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 10. Counterfeit miracles. Satan is in the miracle business. And he's in counterfeit tongues, counterfeit miracles, counterfeit righteousness, counterfeit healing, counterfeit everything. And when you fall for that, you fall right into the hands of Satan. And number eight, Satan has a system of gods. And we don't have that so much in our country that we're aware of. But he has a system of God, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4. Now in India, you would understand that. If I were teaching a class in uh, Telugu, and I spoke Telugu perfectly, and I said, Satan has a system of gods, they would understand that, because their whole culture is a system of gods. And we might have a harder time understanding that, but we have a system of gods. Our system of gods is... Man, I really wish I was watching Hannity and Colton's instead of sitting here. Our systems of gods would be, I really wish I were watching television. I really wish I were doing something that was more fun than sitting and listening to this. Whatever you place in importance over Bible doctrine is your God. So he has a system of gods. And do you know why the United States of America is the United States of Entertainment? It's a system of gods. And uh, people go all out for entertainment. And all wealthy people do. If there was another wealthy country, they'd do the same thing. And we're a wealthy country, and we have the greatest entertainment in the world, and there's nothing wrong with going to the movies, nothing wrong with being entertained. But when you place that above Bible doctrine, you've made yourself a god. When you place a movie over Bible doctrine. You've made a God out of a movie. Out of Hollywood. What kind of God is that? A liberal one and a weird one. So there are a system of gods that Satan has developed. Now false teachers are part of this satanic strategy. And again we have the attention seeking behavior of false teachers and oftentimes an attention seeking disorder from false teachers. And oftentimes this attention is sparked by jealousy. People want attention from people. So let's take a look now at 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. First John chapter 4, verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Excuse me. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Who's the Antichrist? Satan. There's an Antichrist coming who will come in human form in the tribulation. That's what John is referring to. He's saying, look, you've heard of the Antichrist. You've heard eschatology. He's saying you've heard of eschatology in which uh, the Antichrist is going to come and in which he's going to attack Israel, etc. And there will be uh, Jew against Jew and there will be Gentiles against Jew. He says What he's saying is you've heard about all of that, but then he adds at the end, is already in the world. What he's saying is you've heard of the Antichrist. What he's actually saying is you were so impressed with my messages about eschatology but I'm telling you right now, he's already in the world! That's probably how he said it. Which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. That shocked him. Because, you see, anytime you preach eschatology, it gets people kind of riled up. They like to hear about it. 
who lets me hear about prophecy in the future? And when John taught it, that's exactly what happened then. And they got all riled up and said, yes, let's hear the eschatology. Oh yes, there's going to be an antichrist. And he's going to come and do this and that and the other. I'm so glad I came here, brother. It was so nice to learn about that. And I'm glad I know about the future. And you know what John said to him after he taught all of that? He said, you've heard that he's coming. But even now is already in the world. Now that should have shocked him. What he's saying is, the person you've learned about in eschatology is already here. He's already doing his work. And that's something that kind of threw him off. So he was saying to them, look, there's evil spirits out there. And there are already people who are false prophets who have gone out into the world. And there are already people who don't teach dispensations. And there are already people who are teaching a false system of salvation. That is salvation by works rather than salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. And that is what John was teaching his congregation. And then he says, yes, you've heard about the Antichrist. In other words, you're really excited about hearing about him. And he's already here. And he's already doing these things. Nothing new under the sun. People always go the same way. They like to have their ears itched. So what does the Satan system provide? It provides a phony, hypocritical facade. Satan system provides bleeding heart do-gooders who act as if they love every everyone, as long as you don't cross them, they love everyone. And these are the people who say we need to be all things to all men. They take that from what the Apostle Paul said, but don't know what it means. And so they say we need to be all things to all men, apart from any spiritual standard based on Bible doctrine. And uh, that's found in Matthew 7.15. And also, the deceitful people seek to stimulate your ego. The fastest way to get sucked into a false doctrine church is for someone to stimulate your ego. I've had the unfortunate opportunity of going into some legalistic churches. I went, in ignorance really, but I just went to because uh, my uh, cousin went and we were buddies so I said well I'll go with you let's go I'll check it out not that I was going to go with it I said well, I'll go with you whatever nothing else to do anyway so I sat in that church and they sought to stimulate ego just so happened that that same pastor had heard me play the violin earlier and of course I do a very good job at it so the pastor thought or did not so good anymore but I used to do a very good job at it and so this pastor came up to me and said you know you're so good I wish I could have you play here every time the doors are open what's that stimulate ego but why did he want to stimulate my ego well he thought talent will bring in more people let's go watch the violinist then we can hear a bunch of gobbledygook and I'd probably end up playing my violin more than he taught. That's the way it would end up. But stimulate ego. <laughs> and it didn't stimulate my ego. My ego had been stimulated since the time I was in seventh grade by that stuff and I learned something about it. I'm surely glad I had that talent because I learned something about people. They're phony. When they see a talent, I don't know what it is about it. It's just a talent. Well, they just want to come praise you, etc. And I thought, I'm the same now as I've ever been. I can play the violin. It's a talent. Something I was born with. Something that is genetically predisposed or even maybe a uh, gift from God. Whatever. Doesn't matter. These people should treat me no different whether I have a talent or not. And that was my attitude about it after a while. And once you get enough praise from people, you kind of get sick of it. Unless you're a little weird. Unless you're like the Hollywood types. And they love to even uh, get rewards. What do they call it? What's that reward they get? The uh, It's a stupid name, and it deserves a stupid name. It's a big Golden Globe type of Oscar. They get an Oscar. That, that's the name it deserves. You have an Oscar reward. And they get all happy about Oscar 
It's also the name of a wiener. So what? So what? You've got an Oscar award. Oscar. What kind of name is that anyway? Yet uh, they get all puffed up about it. Well, I've won an Oscar. Yeah, well, I ate an Oscar Mayer wiener. So what? What is your point? People make a big deal out of talent. That's part of that's part of what attention seeking behavior. Hollywood has an attention seeking disorder. All of Hollywood has an attention seeking disorder, except for very few. Some of you must be getting tired and giggly. So Satan has a specific policy called evil. And this is what we will get into tomorrow night. He has a specific policy called evil. And he made specific doctrinal attacks on the cross. And he has specific satanic strategies. And then we should be about done with all of that. Except we will go over. I think we'll still be studying on Sunday. Because we will go over all of these things once again. Make them available to people. You can't go over these things just once. I think the colonel would have went up, he went over the four spiritual mechanics over and over again in spiritual dynamics, and yet I doubt that very many people have memorized it whatsoever. Oh, they got tired of hearing about the spiritual mechanics, but they never memorized what it was. But that's human nature. That's just the way it goes. Nothing I can do about that. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.